All right, um, so first up, uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've never presented here before, um, and I feel like an idiot. I've been talking to people for years, and they're like, dude, you gotta go to BrewCon, you gotta go to BrewCon, you gotta go to BrewCon, it's the best con in the world. I'm like, every con says that. Um, but uh, I brought my family here, and the kids are up there uh, playing video games right now that we all grew up on, right? Um, I think they're playing Street Fighter and uh, uh, Mortal Kombat, and my son ripped my spine out my back, and he's like, Dad, this is truly the greatest conference in the world. <laughs> I'm like, all right, son, that's great to know. Um, so the presentation is on active defense, and we're going to kind of talk about appropriate ways to handle active defense and inappropriate ways to handle active defense. I'm going to share with you guys some tools and techniques that we use regularly to try to track and mess with attackers, but the whole point of it is, um, it kind of boils down to a quote attributed to this gentleman. Um, his definition of insanity was what? Einstein's definition of insanity. Yeah doing the same thing over and over again and somehow expecting different results. And I believe if we look at computer security as it is today, we are doing the same thing again and again and again and again, and we continuously expect that we're going to get different results out of what we do. If we have a vendor all of a sudden that puts a new like, set of next generation behind their product, or my personal favorite now is a fourth generation artificial intelligence and log analysis, it's, it, it's if they're still selling us the same crap and things are not getting better. We're doing the same things again and again and again and they're continuing to fail. Uh, I spent a lot of time talking with penetration testers, uh, you know, um, Nickerson and Dave Kennedy and a bunch of people and the sad thing is we continue to have the same conversations We continue to break into organizations successfully and we're seeing the exact same mistakes and in many of our customers We see the same mistakes every year. It's like so you didn't patch the server last year We got in now we got in through the same we've had customers where we literally have taken the report changed the date and resubmitted it and they're Like wow, this is great, um, but we keep on making these mistakes in computer security, and I want to get to the root of why this is a problem. Um, it'd be very, very easy to get up here and say, security is broken and everything sucks, and we all suck, and we should all feel bad, let's go drinking, and everybody would be okay with that, but I want to get into the heart of why things are, in fact, broken. So a couple of quick questions, shout them out. Name three antivirus vendors, points for big names in the industry. Symantec. McAfee, okay, with just Symantec and McAfee, what percentage of the market do we have right there? 95%, right? It's massive. And some of you will be like, well, we might use Sophos, we might use Trend, that's great, but it's a handful of vendors. Name three firewall IDS IPS vendors. Checkpoint, Palo Alto, Zone Alarm. <laughs> the only one that works. <laughs> I'm a little bit, you know, sad that no one shouted out IP tables. You know, there's always at least one of those geek. It's like, oh, IP, IP tables. But with the vendors that we said, Checkpoint firewalls and, and, and Palo Alto firewalls, we see the same vendors again and again and again and again. So think of these vendors for just a couple of seconds, and I got a question for you. Who do you consider to be your main adversaries? Who keeps you awake at night? Are you afraid of China? Are you afraid of Russia? Vladimir Putin has great abs. I, I, love, I, love, I love leaders who look good without their shirts on. In America, <laughs> in America, we have a problem because neither one of our candidates that are running for president I want to see without their shirts. <laughs> By the way, this is my official I'm sorry uh, tour on behalf of America. I'm going around the country <laughs> and around the world. I think... No one, this is interesting because no one in America is voting for anybody uh, the next election. You have to decide who you're going to vote against, and uh, that's, that's somewhat difficult. But uh, Vladimir Putin, you've got to admit, uh, looks fantastic without a shirt. He's recently been passed as the most attractive uh, state, uh, head of state by, the, uh, by the, uh, the head of Canada, who actually looks better without a shirt than him and comes crawling out of caves. It's, it's kind of a weird thing. But he can be scary. Don't look at him too long. You'll turn pregnant, uh, so be very careful. Um, we also have organized crime. Uh, we have Pinky in the Brain. Um, I don't know if that cartoon like, managed to infect the rest of the, uh, of the planet. But they started every single episode 
where one of the mice said to the other one, you know, what are we going to do tonight? And they're like, the same thing we do every night. We try to take over the world. And uh, are these the people that keep you awake? Are these the people that concern you? Um, and you'll notice that there's something missing from this slide. What would be missing from this slide? <laughs> right? So are you worried about the NSA? Do they keep you awake at night? Are these the people that you're afraid of? Either way, it doesn't really matter who you're afraid of. Whenever you're thinking of your real adversary, and please don't tell me that you're terrified of, you know, some bot herder or you're terrified of some script kitty. You're really worried about nation-state level attackers that have really, to be honest, the, uh, the time, the budget, the person power, the rockin' abs to break into your network successfully. Whenever we're looking at organizations trying to attack your organization, if you're really worried about a nation state level attack or organized crime, a targeted attack from these organizations means that they have the time and money to bypass the limited number of technologies that we listed a few slides ago. We're all using the same firewalls. We're all using the exact same IDS IPS systems. We're using the exact same antivirus engines. And very rarely do we ever get even remotely close to being creative. So a good friend of ours, um, Dave Shackelford, who's a little bit insane. Um, if you don't follow him on Twitter, you probably shouldn't. Um, no, I'm joking. Dave, Dave is fantastic. He's a little bit horrifying from time to time. But he always says any presentation that has anything from the Verizon data breach report should be immediately ignored. So I immediately put in a slide with some, with some quotes or a graph from the Verizon data breach report because I think that this is very important. These numbers haven't shifted in the past few years that this report has come out. Um, they just don't show this particular graph anymore, and you can kind of get to why, right? This is how organizations have detected that they were compromised. So they woke up one morning, they found out that they were compromised. How exactly did they find out that they were compromised? Well, at the top, we have unrelated party 34% of the time. We drop down to fraud detection 24% of the time. 9% of the time is their customers. Customer picks up the phone and says, hey, you've been compromised customers. If we drop down a little bit further, we get to law enforcement and actor disclosure, so you know, posting user IDs and passwords, uh, passwords out on pastebin. Unknown, I don't know how the hell that happens. <laughs> how do you wake up in the morning and be like, hey, we got breached. How do you know? I, I don't. Um, just <laughs> came in, I slipped, and holy crap, we're compromised. I, I don't know how we actually came to that conclusion. Reported by our users. Think of all the jokes about how dumb users are with using computers, right? We, make, we joke about them all the time. And they're detecting 4% of the breaches. If we drop down, financial audit is 3%. But right there in those ones, network intrusion detection, log review, fraud detection, host-based IDS, which is your AV, incident response, IT audit, and mon uh, external monitoring service are all 1% each. That's where you're spending your budget. That's where you're spending all your money. So I, I have this thing that I like to say, I'm going to start a new company. Um, it's going to be a security monitoring service. And what happens is I will call you at periodic random intervals. And I'm just going to say, you're breached. And you'd be like, we are? I'm like, hell yeah, you're compromised. How do you know? We don't. We're going to charge half as much as the uh, managed security service providers that are out there because we care twice as much. And the name of my company, hold on, is unknown. <laughs> Our marketing propaganda will say five times more effective than any of your other security technologies. <laughs> because it is, right? So whenever I say things are broken, I think that we pretty much universally kind of agree that things are broken. But let's go back to try to think about why things are broken. Because it's very easy to say, well, developers are stupid. Systems administrators are dumb. Management's not giving us the money that we need. We need to buy more goodies. We need to buy more security technologies. I, I love customers that are like, we have implemented Carbon Black. We have implemented Silence because we put it in a lab with four computers and we could detect everything. And then you roll it out to 20, 30,000 things and it becomes white noise. You have so much popping up all the time. You're like, let's never talk of this again because it's too much data, right? So we keep on buying these new toys again and again and again and again, and the toys don't work. 
But if we're looking at security, you know, an overused quote, all warfare is based on deception, there is little to no deception right now in computer security at all. You're all using the exact same technologies. You're all buying the exact same products that you can purchase very easily. We've got a lab back at our offices at BHIS. We've got about $150,000 a year, and we have most of the vendors that we encounter in our penetration tests. So before we launch a single attack at you, we know that it's going to work. We know that the C2 channel is going to work. We know that we're going to bypass the endpoint security protection suite simply because we were able to purchase it and we were able to use it effectively before we launch a single attack at an organization. So if we're looking at detection time plus reaction time must be less than the amount of time it takes for a bad guy to successfully attack your network, we're hosed. Because we know the technologies, we can drop that detection time to where you'll never detect us. And if you can't detect anything, you're not going to react. So we can attack with impunity. So when we're looking at active defense, I'm going to break it into three separate areas. Annoyance, attribution, and attack. The reason why I break them up into three separate areas is because many times it gets lumped together as simply hacking back trying to hack the hackers, gaining access to a hacker's computer system. And that doesn't work real well from a legal perspective. That doesn't work real well from organizations, legal departments saying, yeah, this totally sounds legit. Let's totally hack into that server in, in, in Taipei. Just we don't know who owns it. We're just going to take it over. You can't do that. But we have a range of options that we can work through to make things a little bit more effective. So every year, uh, we at Security Weekly, we do this. Um, uh, we do this webcast called Sacred Cash Cow Tipping. Um, and in Sacred Cash Cow Tipping, we bypass all the major AV vendors, and we do it the night before we do the presentation. Every single AV vendor, we do a PowerPoint presentation on how to bypass it. We have a video to demonstrate how to bypass it as well. Um, by the way, a quick series of jokes. I'm here with my family. Um, they're around here somewhere, I hope. Um, and you know whenever you're driving through the countryside and you see cows, what do children say? They go, moo, right? So whenever we're driving through the countryside, my kids go, tss, because that's the sound they make on daddy's grill. <laughs> so we do the sacred cash cow tipping, not necessarily to say, hey, look at us. I mean, that's a little bit of it. But really, we're trying to get the point across to anybody that's out there. And this is designed mainly for management, that if you can bypass one AV engine, it's not an issue of just switching to another AV engine. There's a number of managers that after we successfully break into their organization, they say, well, you bypass Symantec. Well, let's get McAfee on the phone. They're clearly going to be better. And we need to get the point across that no, that is not going to make anything better. If you're looking at AV, you're looking at IDS, you're looking at firewalls, you're looking at IPS, they're like a commodity. It's like toilet paper. You really don't care what brand is over there in the bathroom. You're just happy that it's there. You need it. It doesn't really matter. It's not a higher quality or lesser quality that'll change your life in a fundamental way. We also have a number of tools that we've written, um, we released publicly um, for command and control uh, to bypass a lot of products. I'll give you guys a link here in a little bit. This is a tool called VS Agent. It does beaconing once every 5, 10, 15, 20 seconds. And all of its commands are Base64 encoded in a view state parameter. And we do this to bypass all the products that are out there like Palo Alto and various C2 detection engines. And most of them should be able to detect this, but they don't because view state is supposed to be a randomized parameter and its length is variable. So it's very difficult for them to write a signature to detect this type of stuff. So we make all of this available, and we put all this stuff available simply because we want organizations to start doing better at their day-to-day -day security. Um, so I have this tiny URL, because you can totally trust tiny URLs that your presenters give you. And I have the uh, slides for AV bypass here. I have VS Agent, the back door I was talking about. Oops, I know we've gone too far. VS Agent, GCAT is a backdoor that we wrote um, initially that does all the command and control over Gmail. Um, and I have all these things available for you guys to download. And the reason why all this is available is because I want organizations to do the C2 worksheet before their next penetration test. Um, it kind of goes through and it says, can you detect DNS cat? We have Ron in the audience. I should put DNS cat too. He's constantly on me for that. I guess I could just change it. Um, VS agent is our backdoor that we wrote and a whole bunch of Metasploit modules. And see how your organization fares. Actually go through 
and run through this spreadsheet and see what you can and cannot detect. Don't hire somebody else to do it. God, no. Um, no, no, no. Do it yourself before the test begins. Because um, to be honest, like, we get sick and tired of documenting the same crap again and again and again every time we test. We, we love it whenever a company's like, we got all of our crap in order, and they're really genuinely hard. We thrive on that. And this gets the low-hanging fruit out of the way and before you actually bring in any type of firm. So the problem with all of this basically boils down to we're building very static walls. We're building very static walls that anybody can purchase and they can do analysis and they can find ways to bypass these various technologies before they even launch an attack at your organization. Your defenses are static. They're known and I can download them and I can run them in my lab before I launch an attack against you. We have some other problems in the industry, a question of who do we trust in this industry? Um, who, who do we actually go to cons and who do we want to see present, right? So many of us in this industry, we trust the penetration testing community. Pen tester gets up in front of a slide uh, show like this and they're like, look, we can bypass antivirus engines. Here's a bunch of bad tools that we've written and you guys can use them all. And we get so excited about this. The question is, can you necessarily trust a pen tester to give you detailed analysis on how to better secure your organization? In many ways, asking a penetration tester for ways to secure your organization is like asking a three-year-old how to load your dishwasher because they're really good at throwing spaghetti at your walls. It's like, wow, you really made a hell of a mess. Uh, fantastic job. Maybe we should try to figure out how we should clean our house better from them. Um, I love this picture. Um, the gentleman back there, his name is Heaven Sent. And the guy with uh, I hacked written on his head is Darren, intern Darren from Security Weekly. Um, we had intern Darren wear a MiFi on his head, um, hotspot, and he went around a mall without a shirt that said free wireless internet with the SSID because we wanted to see how many people would use free wireless internet for some random dude with the SSID like stenciled on his belly. The answer was a lot. Um, <laughs> so. We, uh, we, sent him to, uh, we sent him to DEF CON a couple of years ago, and he got invited to the ninja party. You know, the ninja party, right? He's, you've got to be very careful about how you get into the ninja party. He was super excited because he was going to meet all the luminaries and in information security. He was so excited, he started drinking at noon the day before. And <laughs> by the time he got there, he was completely passed out. And... Uh, and Heaven Sent actually protected him because other people at the party were like, dude, he's totally passed out. We should throw him in the pool. <laughs> when somebody's so drunk they're passed out, don't throw them in pools. <laughs> they sink. It's, it, then you've got to drag them out. You've got to give them mouth to mouth. And you're like, this sucks. And then they vomit all over the place. But anyway, um, but your point is you can't trust a pen tester because they're going to exact their revenge. And that's why you wrote that on Darren's head. There were other things that were written on his head. Um, there were tons of pictures. Uh, Dan Kaminsky has a picture with him passed out. Jeff Moss has a picture of him passed out. He got to meet everybody that he wanted to meet. Unfortunately, he doesn't remember any of it. <laughs> so, all right. So let's talk a little bit about OODA loops, right? Observe, orient, decide, and act. This kind of also fits into active defense. We're making a transition from things are broken to how do we make things better. So if we can look at our ability in computer security to observe, our ability to observe sucks. If you keep sinking hundreds of thousands of dollars into your sim, it's not going to get any better. You're not going to hit a magical mark of like $350,000 where all of a sudden that crap works. Um, and it's also interesting when you look at sims, for example, for event log management, um, just a couple of quick questions. You talk, you talk to your sim vendor and you're like, what event should we log? What's their answer? All of them. Every single event log. Put it all right there, right? Their business model and how much they charge you is based on what? How much data they collect. Do you guys see a conflict there? Just a little bit? So here's a question for you. Out of all of the, the event IDs that you ingest in your organization, what percentage of those event IDs have signatures written for them? What percentage of those are you actually writing reports or alerts against? Don't, don't answer the question, but go back and, and, and try, to, try to figure that out. I think you'll be a little bit shocked, right? But it's not working. The more event logs that we throw in, the less we have the ability to see. It all becomes white noise, right? So as I said, detection time plus reaction time must be less than the amount of time it takes for a bad guy to attack our networks. And all warfare is based on deception. Well, let's start playing with this. So active defense. 
is not about hacking back. Well, maybe just a scooch, right? But it's just one component of what active defense can be. It is not about a specific technical solution. Um, it's not about buying a specific product and then all of a sudden everything is really good. It is also not about revenge. Um, we've had a number of customers that have came to us over the years, um, a lot of times financial institutions in Asia. And those will say, look, we have somebody that hacked into our network. We want to find this bad guy. And I'm like, great, are you guys going to work with Interpol? Are you guys going to work with local police? And they're like, no. Yeah, I'm not taking that gig. <laughs> I like to be able to sleep at night. I don't like the idea of technologies and things like that being used to take out people who are hackers. It's kind of, it's kind of like taking out my own in a weird sort of way. I don't like that. It shouldn't be about revenge. And if you go into this with revenge in your heart, you're not going to do very well at it. Um, it. It really is a dead end in many, many, many ways. So active defense is about a range of solutions. It's about trying to tip UDA in our favor. Um, it's about trying to come up with solutions that we can put in place with annoyance, attribution, and attack that basically won't make your legal department freak out as soon as you talk about implementing these in your organization. I hate to do this to you. I know a lot of times whenever you present in Europe, I'm like, here's a law in the United States. Um, that, that doesn't go over real well, especially in the European Union with the privacy directives and things of that nature. But I, I think that this, this legal case is very, very interesting. A little bit of background for you. Uh, Susan Clements Jeffrey was a substitute teacher in the United States. And one of her students approached her and said, look, I have a, a MacBook Pro that, that, I, that I found, and I'll sell it to you for $50. Now, you know that that MacBook Pro is hot. You know it's been stolen, right? So she naturally is like, oh, okay, that sounds good to me. And, and make it even funnier, she bought it at a bus stop, which just for some reason buying a notebook from a student at a bus stop that's been stolen seems a bit shady. And she immediately took this notebook computer back home and started cyber sexting her boyfriend. Well, that computer was stolen from another school district, and they had LoJack software from Absolute Software installed on it. So they could track the notebook's location, they could track what websites it was going to, they could have it beacon back, and they could turn on the camera. So her camera was already on, because she's getting it on with her, her boyfriend, cyber style. And the legal brief is awesome, because it reads, there were multiple pictures of Susan Clements Jeffries in various states of undress and sexual activity. So she sued the police, she sued the school district, and she sued Absolute Software for violating her privacy. Now, this was not her computer. It was a stolen computer. And she was saying that they violated her privacy. And this is what the judge ruled. So the judge, Walter Rice, said it's one thing to cause a stolen computer to report its IP address or its geographical location in an effort to track it down. It is something entirely different to violate federal wiretapping laws by intercepting the electronic communications of the person using the stolen laptop. So there's a line in the sand, and I know that this is US-based, but in these gray areas, in computers and computer security, if there's a law or there's a case in Europe, many American judges will use that to inform their judgments, and the same thing in the United States being used here in Europe as well, so we have at least something. But the line in the sand is, you know, if you're just trying to find something or get an IP address, that's probably okay. I'm going to put an asterisk after that because we're going to revisit it. But if you're actually taking pictures and prosing the files of a hacker's computer, you've more than likely crossed that line. So we use that as kind of the line of get a warrant. So what we have created is something called the Active Defense Harbinger Distribution. And the Active Defense Harbinger Distribution is designed to be Kali for Active Defense, but a little bit better put together. I, so I got a question. How many of you guys ever use Kali? And there's like 400 tools on Kali, and you're like, how the hell does this crap work? Or what does this do? There's really not a very good user manual with it. And I love what the guys are doing at Kali. It's awesome. Trying to keep all that crap up to date is exceedingly difficult. But trying to find good step-by-step -step instructions can be somewhat difficult for some of the tools. So this is ADHD. I'm running it right here. And uh, with this tool, every single one of the uh, tools that's on it has step-by-step -step instructions for every single one of the tools. Um, and it even has a video walkthrough. Now, we're in the process of updating the videos, but you have step-by-step -step instructions for absolutely everything that I'm about to talk to. 
And the reason why we wanted this set up this way is we don't want people to get in starting to use the tool and basically say, well, crap, that sucks. I don't know how any of this works. You can literally copy and paste the commands, and you can run through absolutely all of them. So anything I'm talking about is not pie in the sky crap. It's actually things that you can download and you can use right now today in your own organization. I don't have time to go through absolutely all of the tools, but I'm going to go through some of my favorites for different uh, types of things in active defense. So let's do this. Let's move on. So as I said, I like to break active defense into three categories, annoyance, attribution, and attack. With annoyance, we're simply trying to increase the amount of work effort that an attacker has to do to break into our network. This can be done in a wide variety of different ways. I'm going to focus on just a couple of them. But you can create multiple LinkedIn accounts for your organization that go nowhere. But if somebody starts interacting, it generates an alert. You can create different domain users in your organization that as soon as they're accessed, it immediately generates an alert. I see people that create Active Directory uh, domain admin accounts that aren't authorized to log into any workstations. And as soon as somebody tries to authenticate with that account, it generates an alert. What we're trying to do is create a maze. We're trying to increase the amount of work effort a bad guy has to do in order to successfully break into our organization. That's ultimately what we're after. That's it. And it's simple. And these particular techniques are also very easy to implement in your organization. You don't have to talk to a lawyer to set it up. So let me kind of walk through one of these. Um, we have a number of different tools, but I'm going to show you a web bug server. Oops, nope. I'm not going to show you web bug server yet. I'm going to show web labyrinth. Here we go. So this one first. So with Web Labyrinth, it's basically a, web, a website that you can um, put any text, you can do anything you want with it, but you would put it in a part of your website that your general user population um, would never go to. But an attacker might, if somebody's trying to attack your website. So this would be a place that they would go. So you could do like index, or not index, you do robots.txt saying admin.php, don't go there. Users are never going to go there. An attacker is absolutely going to go there. Now, this is just set up as a proof of concept from the text, but it's easy to make this as hidden links, do it a number of different ways. But if you select any of these links, it brings up more randomized text and more directories. And eventually, it's going to pop up an email as well, just kind of mix things up. So what does this look like to an attacker? Well, I don't know if you guys know this, but a lot of like just web application pen testers, whenever they use their automated tools, they fire them up at night. And then they let them run while they're sleeping. And then they call you the next morning. It's like, yeah, I was working late last night. Whew, uh, yeah, I tested the web app. Very thorough test. I tested it for eight hours. They're really not testing it. They're running an automated crawler. They're letting burp run. They're using some automated test tool suite. So here's what you can do to them. So what we can do is we can set it up so whenever they're crawling your website, as soon as they start crawling the website and they go to bed, um, this starts to happen. Oh, do I not have? There we go. All right. So it runs, and it runs, and it runs, it runs, it runs, and some magical things happen. One thing that happens is a lot of the automated scanning tools, they load all the links that they discover in memory. And the memory continues to grow and grow and grow until your screen turns blue. <laughs> your screen is broken. But if they're using a Linux-based computer system, um, that's fine. If they're using wget or burp or something like that, it actually creates a local, um, kind of creates a, a, a local directory with the, uh, with the data that it's actually been identified. Oops. Oh, my god. Can't type. There we go. So in just a few seconds, it went through and it created a local archive of all the pages that it hit and it crawled. An, an automated attack suite, if somebody tries to run it against your website and it hits this, it's going to fill up their hard drive and it's going to crash their computers. Those are good things. Now, there's always somebody in the room, they're like, well, yeah, <clears throat> if I was doing a web pen test and I saw that, I would stop automated crawling and I'd start doing it manually. I'm okay with that. Um, <laughs> I think that that's a good thing. Remember detection time, reaction time, attack time? 
So if you have to go through and click every single link manually because you're afraid of falling into this hole, the amount of time it takes for you to successfully attack the website just went through the roof. Also, it creates a database entry for all of the different user agent strings and how many hits it received. So you now have alerts. So your ability to detect the attack just went up. The bad guy's ability to perceive and actually find your website has gone down. See, we're not looking for perfect here. What we're trying to do is create traps and pitfalls that take longer for the attacker to go through in order to enumerate your entire attack surface on your organization. This is awesome. And this does work. We implement this on a number of different customers, and they absolutely love it because they actually see results fairly quickly. And all of it's free. You guys can download it all and implement it wherever you want. So that's fine. So that's uh, evil web servers. Another cool little tool is one called Honeyport. Um, this one's written by Paul, so if it's a little bit buggy, um, <laughs> oh man, I'm, I'm sorry. So it's Honeyports, and then cross-platform. The directory structure has been fixed in the most recent version. All right, so Honeyports, we have four different versions or three different versions that are running here. And uh, whenever we run it, it just simply listens on a port. And if you just kind of run it with uh, no parameters at all, it'll give you the usage information. It'll come back and be like, hey, I, I, need, I need a port. Um, so what we do is we do minus P, and I'll do 2222 because I'm not creative at all. And then um, as soon as anybody connects to that system, on that port, and it, this only works with a full established connection. I'm going to explain why that's important here in just a little bit. Come on, get in there. Come on. There we go. Pops up and it says, thank you for connecting. That's awesome. That's great. Now, if I try to make the connection again, I'm blocked. Um, completely locked out at this point. Now, I mentioned that this only fires with a full established connection. The reason why we have this set up to only fire with a full established connection is because if we did it on just SYN packets, it would be easy for a bad guy to spoof a legitimate IP address and DDoS your own network. So you have to do the full established connection with a SYN, SYN ACK, and then the ACK back and forth in a FIN, and then it'll start blocking you at that particular point. So this is easy to implement. We had one of our customers that set this up. They uh, got uh, a notification that uh, their CEO noticed that they have an East Coast Network Operations Center and a West Coast Operations Center, and they decided they were going to have tryouts. And he said, we're going to cut costs by getting rid of one of our redundant network operations centers. Now, I know a lot of you in your organizations, you have multiple network operations centers, and that's, you have them for redundancy. But he's like, why do we have all these IT geeks? Let's get rid of one group. So they came to us, and we implemented this all over their organization. They had something like 2,000 Linux servers. The pen testing company showed up to evaluate which of these knocks was the most secure. And they started up a simple little SYN scan. They saw all these different ports that were open all over the place. And then <laughs> um, they started up Nessus, because that's what all pen testing firms do, right? That's legitimate, right? Nmap, Nessus, Metasploit, that's pen test. You know, pay someone 30 grand for that, right? And as soon as they started hitting it, the entire network goes dark. Now, when you're testing and an entire network goes dark on you, and, you know, what, what do you think happened? Huh? Router imploded. Something bad, right? Because, you know, it, it could be there's a firewall, but that's like the best case scenario. You immediately jump to the worst case scenario. I just killed the entire network. And they went to the company after about a day, like, oh, I don't know what's going on. I, I can't get to anything. And the company's like, well, no, everything seems fine. Eventually, it came to light what they'd done. And the pen testing firm was like, we demand that you remove this. According to the PCI scanning standards, there's supposed to be no firewalls between us and your systems. And the customer said, well, every finding from this point on, I want you to document that you had to reduce the security, or we had to reduce the security to allow your test to go properly. Now, do you think that wording showed up in the report at all? No, absolutely not. But it greatly increased the amount of time it took for the attacker, or the pen testing firm in this example, to try to identify live hosts. So what are some other ones that I've got? Um, Wookie Boy. This is an example of a company that's actually running this. And it's interesting because there's actually a financial impact. Um, they were running artillery. And artillery is by Dave Kennedy and the fine folks at TrustedSec. 
and it is free, and it is on ADHD with step-by-step -step instructions on how to configure it. And they let it run throughout the course of the day, and as soon as IP addresses trip the ports, they immediately update all of their different routers, all their different firewalls to automatically block these IP addresses at the edge of their network. What this does is it greatly reduces the amount of logs that their IDS IPS systems are getting by just simply filtering out the script kitties every single day. And they get something like 20,000 blocked IP addresses on the outside of this organization per day, with the bad guys shifting IP addresses around all the time. That's fantastic. And it also reduces the total amount of logs, which reduces the total amount of storage that they have. And it allows them to focus on a more refined list of attackers that they can track a little bit further. And there's some other tools in here. Like I said, there's a lot. We don't have time to go through all of them. But check it out. We've got videos for all of them as well. Next, let's talk about attribution. Cyber attribution is the holy grail of computer security today, right? So you got threat intelligence feeds. I hate threat intelligence feeds. It's like trying to implement computer security by driving your car with a rear view mirror. You're watching attacks that happened to other people 48 hours ago, and you're like, yeah, well, this is clearly the types of attacks that we should be watching for today. It's, it's horrid. If you guys want to, come up and talk to me and argue me, with me about it all you want, but I think they're crap. That's my opinion. I have yet to come across any company that I've done work with over the past few years that's like cyber threat intelligence fee feeds are awesome. They've improved our security. It just doesn't happen at all. So why, what are they doing? Well, they look at the attack patterns, and they say, well, these IP addresses over here must be with Estonia. Or they look at the malware. I love it whenever they reverse engineer the malware, and they say, hey, this malware has Chinese in it. It must be the Chinese. Really? <laughs> so last year, we released something called the Super Happy Fun Time APT Generation Kit. You could upload any executable you wanted, and it would automatically inject characters inside that executable in a language of your choosing. It would be Russian, Chinese, North Korean. It would play you the theme song for that, uh, that country while it was loading. And we actually had a couple of people that were doing forensics and they saw a couple of presentations. They're like, this is clearly from North Korea because there's Korean characters. And uh, I can't remember. I think the Korean characters that we put in were North Korea is best Korea. And if you copied and pasted it, it's like, well, this is clearly our malware. And uh, a lot of people fell for that simply by the characters. So let's talk about how we can actually do cyber attribution a little bit better. So let's say hypothetically that one of your workstations is compromised, right? Once again, unknown is the name of my company. Get in on the ground floor right now with VC Capital. We're all going to be rich. But unknown as the company. I have a system that's compromised. I call you up and I say, your system's compromised. Because of course it is, right? 5% of the time, I'm correct. So you have this computer that's compromised. You can put a document on that computer, on the desktop, and make it interesting for the bad guy. What would be an interesting document that a bad guy would want to open? They would have to open that document. Passwords.txt or passwords.doc or an Excel spreadsheet, right? They're not going to leave that alone. They're going to go right for it. Um, the fine folks um, um, from PowerShell are here and presenting. One of them, I can't remember which one. Uh, but they got tools like Bloodhound, and you can use PowerShell Empire to search for files with specific names, and you can pull those down, and you can run them. That's great. We know the attackers are going to do that. So let's create a document that's going to be interesting to them. So one of the documents that you can create, I already created here. I just called it web.doc, and it says, what a buggy document. And you can run it, and you can type in it, and you can do whatever you want in it. Um, you can even open it inside of, uh, um, you can open it up inside of, uh, Linux, I you know, use Obby Word or something. It says the document is not valid, but at any rate, it's like, well, OK, so that didn't work. But you can still type in it, and everything works. It's, it's great. So what happens with this, though, is when the bad guy is opening up that document, every time you open that document, that document reaches back to my computer system. And specifically, it'll pull back a cascading style sheet or an image source tag. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but Microsoft Word is a, um, it's a web browser. And it'll honor certain elements of HTML for images and cascading style sheets and try to import those into the document. Oh, by the way, those work with or without macros enabled. They're completely independent of macros. But every time you open that document, it's making a callback to my computer system. Um, even, if it is, um, even if it is a Linux computer system, it's still making those, those callbacks as well. So you can see here that we have a callback the GVS or GVFS, as you see here, that's Obby Word. This works with OpenOffice. This works with Obby Word. It does not work with Gedit. 
because Gedit looks at it as an HTML document and won't, won't render it properly. And it works with all the different versions of Microsoft Word regardless of whether or not macros are enabled. So now, the bad guy pulls that document back and they open that document, you now have their IP address. Now, the IP address isn't hyper accurate as far as where they're at, but at least you can get within the country in many situations. And many times when they're using something like Tor, they don't bother to set up Microsoft Word or Office to actually go through Tor. So you can use this as a way to get some level of geographical attribution for the bad guys. And the code is dead simple. It's very, very easy to use and easy to have it set up as well. So if I VI it. That's it. And you can put anything you want in the body tags. You can make it look like a real document. You can even copy and paste a real document into it, and it fires every single time it opens. So now we can get some level of attribution. Now, this is great because it almost always works. Um, it almost always works. It doesn't require macros, and they're going to run it, and they're going to open it in a wide variety, variety of different platforms and different applications, and it works consistently. Um, to try to track where they're at. Now that's really cool cyber attribution at that point, right? So now let's talk about Honey Badger. So Honey Badger is kind of the main tool in ADHD, and I went through and pre-cached it. Um, so this is the demo page. It says this is the demo page for the crazy natty ass Honey Badger. Um, and what it does in the background is it actually fires up a Java applet. Now the Java applet is signed on this um, app if you guys download it. It doesn't have the code signing certificate, but this app is signed. And the cool thing about this being signed is the newer protections within Java, they won't fire applets unless they are signed by a valid corporation. So we started up a company in Idaho called Verified Code Certificate. And, um, and now whenever it pops up, the name of the company is, it's Verified Code Certificate. You should totally run this. And that works. So we're sharing that with all of you. Um, and you can change the text to anything you want it to be. Now, what would be some things that would entice an attacker? Like if they saw a web page, they're like, I've got to run this. VPN, right? VPN, that would be awesome. Um, management portals for firewalls and networking equipment. You have to make it enticing for the bad guy. And whenever they fire it off and they actually run the applet, it actually geolocates uh, where they're at. So I ran it uh, earlier. Um, you can see here, I just ran it this morning. Here in Ghent, let me see if my internet connection is working. Please, internet connection work. Is this close to where we're at? Is that at least in the block of where we're at? All right, cool. So the bad guy um, fires this off, and as soon as they fire this applet, it geolocates them. And usually, it geolocates with anywhere between 20 and like 120 meters. This one has an accuracy of 20 meters, as you can see. So that's, that's awesome. Now, how does it actually work? Well, what it's doing in the background is kind of interesting, too. Um, what it's actually doing, if it actually loads for me, um, is it does a wireless site survey. And you don't, have to be, you don't have to have your wireless card joined any access point. It just basically does a survey of all the different wireless access points that are nearby. It pulls them all down, and it sends it into Google. And Google basically responds back with the latitude and longitude of exactly where you are. So that is Honey Badger, and it costs you absolutely nothing. Now, now some of you will say, well, yeah, that's neat, but I don't, I don't know if I like this, this whole page, crazy, natty-ass Honey Badger. I'm, I'm not going to run that. Another tool that we wrote is called Jar Combiner. And what you can do is you can combine or backdoor any jar file that you have with Honey Badger. So if you have a real application in your organization and you'd like to geolocate everybody that uses it, you can embed it into that Java application and every time it fires, it'll fire off the real application and it'll fire off our geolocation Honey Badger code as well. So you can basically implement it anywhere that you want. You can even take real tools like VNC or Java-based VPNs and you can inject it in there and the bad guy thinks that they're sitting on a system and they have direct access to your network from that as well. So a lot of this is created by a, a, a gentleman who's a very, very dear friend of mine, almost a brother, uh, Tim Tomes. A lot of you guys know him from the Nova Hacker Groups, and, and I think you work with him in the Army, if I remember correctly. In fact, if I remember correctly, didn't you teach him absolutely everything he knows? Pretty much, yeah, Chris Gates taught Tim Tomes everything he knows, um, which, is, which is, I'm sure that there's terrifying stories about that. Uh, but I absolutely love Tomes. And he kind of is the one that took over this and coded it up the first time, and we've been maintaining it at Black Hills Information Security for a while. We've ran it for a while. 
um, on a various you know, number of different websites. Like here we have an attacker in Melbourne. We had an, another attacker in Moscow. Um, that was kind of scary. Um, this was fun. We had a student at Pepperdine that was attacking the Black Hills Information Security website, just trying to break in constantly, running all these different scanning tools. So we quickly stood this up, it fired, and it came back and it gave us this latitude and longitude right on top of his dorm, and the accuracy was 106 meters, and his name, username was Chris, and the name of his computer was Snooze. So I called that dorm, and I said, hey, I need to talk to Chris. And they're like, Chris? And I'm like, Snooze. And they're like, oh, Snooze. So they put me through his room, and, uh, and I said, you know, please stop trying to hack my website. And I heard in the background, I was like, oh. Um, so he kind of freaked out a little bit. I told him, yeah, I've got your computer name. You're trying to break into my website. Could you please stop? And uh, he was kind of whimpering, and he asked for an internship. Um, so we, we turned him down, <laughs> turned him down for that. Um, and, and, you know, you have to make it something the bad guy wants to run, like, you know, real VNC, because no attacker would ever run VNC on the outside of the environment. Look, I gotta be honest with you. Image search and Shodan do a port for 5900. It's, it, okay, so it's terrifying, actually, to see how many VNC servers are wide open to the entire world that anybody can access. It's like, I can teach my children in five minutes how to break into tons of different computers. They're like, I just run this VNC app, and it's awesome. Um, and, and bad guys, and even pen testers, when we see these things, are like, wow, these people are idiots, and we're going to run them to gain access into your network. So you can now set these trips and these like little pat pratfalls that any time they run it, you're going to be able to locate them. Um, network user authentication, user ID and password required, an SSL VPN portal. Somebody mentioned that over there. Um, so a number of years ago, very close to here, a big scary bank in Germany invited us over to kind of implement this and do a bunch of different fun things. And some of you are like, well, I'll all banks in Germany are scary. Yeah, they probably are. But they set this up, and the CTO of this particular bank was like, well, no one is going to run this crap. Uh, so we set it up on a couple of their different portals for employee access, a couple of different websites. So we ran it for two weeks. And after two weeks, we had 246 hits. Now, what the hell do you do with this? This is cyber threat intelligence right here. These are the people that are actively trying to break into your organization. They're right there. <laughs> Some of them are in Hawaii. There's that one dude in Siberia. Dude, you really pissed him off, um, right? But it, now, granted, some of these are a little bit off, but these are great. So what they did is they cross-referenced all of these different ASNs and all of these different networks with their egress traffic. And they were able to find four computers that were compromised in their organization. And we're going back to this stuff. That's awesome, right? That's great. So the point of this is, yeah, defense can be fun. It can be. It's not all about attacks all the time. I already talked about JAR Combiner. Um, JAR Combiner allows you to embed um, anything you want inside of a Java applet. So we implemented it so it, it implements, or excuse me, it embeds um, Honey Badger into a Java applet. So on the left, you can see we have a remote desktop se a session running. I think that's JR Desktop. And then it geolocates exactly where you are. Uh, so that's, that's great. So we can do this stuff, and it's free. And we have step by step instructions, and you guys can download it, and you should. So let's talk a little bit about attack. I'll make it real simple for you. If you're ever getting to the point where you want to get full access to a bad guy's computer, get a warrant, hands down. I know that this sounds goofy. <laughs> I know this sounds horrible. But I believe that hackers have a right to privacy. I know that that's stupid. But it extends from the fundamental belief that we should all have a right to privacy. And I know that this is coming from an American. Um, and the whole thing about the NSA, trust me, it means a lot to a lot of us. We care deeply about it. But we should always treat people with a right to privacy. You don't need to go through and look at the browsing history of a hacker. You don't need to go through all their personal files. You don't need to go through all their pictures. Yeah, it makes for great jokes and great stories, but it's unnecessary, right? You don't need it to actually get the bad guys or work with law enforcement or develop a better threat profile for your organization. So set up for all of this. I recommend using um, as, as much as possible non-attrib um, configuration setups. You can get Namecheap, PayPal, Hotmail, DigitalOcean. You want to stand these things up, and you want to tear it down as soon as you're done using it. You don't want to leave these things up for an extended period of time. That's what we would call a bad idea. Um, I really like prepaid uh, gift cards and prepaid credit cards. Do they have those over here? You don't really see those? I know you can order them online anywhere. They're, 
Yeah, you can get them anywhere around here. That's great. Um, a couple of fun facts about prepaid gift cards. Um, the numbers, like if you actually line up the serial numbers, you actually line those up, the numbers aren't sequential, but they're damn close. Like they're within 50 to 100 on many of these different credit cards. I'm not saying, why did it, I'm not saying to steal people's credit cards, but gift cards are great because they're generally not traceable. You generally have to pay for them in cash. And also, if you actually look at the credit card to who the address is associated with, these prepaid credit cards and gift cards, it's almost always associated with the address and the manager of the point of sale. So if you all of a sudden hear about, you know, store managers at Walmart all of a sudden being shot, I'm moving into the woods very, very, very deeply because they now are basically tracking these things back. But prepaid gift cards are just fantastic. They're very, very good. So with all of this in mind, you know, we've laid out that there's some problems, but I think I would really hope that the active defense harbinger distribution for you guys is free. And I don't want to say this is the end all be all of computer security. I'm not saying this is going to solve computer security. If you start implementing these things and you haven't gotten your house in order and you don't have things patched and you're using ridiculously weak passwords, this isn't going to help you. This is not a drop in replacement. What this is meant to be is trying to set up an ecosystem where we can start thinking about different ideas in computer security. To try to think you know, outside of what we've been given. We've been given IDS, IPS, AV, and SIMS, and we're constantly beating that drum. I, I really like user behavioral analytics. I think it's a fantastic improvement. But did you know that most of the time with user behavioral analytics, it's great at detecting pen testers. It's not as good at detecting a determined attacker that can sit on your box and take files off over three, four months, and they can run real low and slow. So it's great, it's something different, it's something new, but we need more good new ideas and creative ideas. And that's why we created ADHD, that's why we released it, that's why we have the videos, that's why we have the step-by-step -step instructions. Because honestly, truly, you know, as bad as everything is, and it looks like it's getting worse constantly, we have to ask ourselves, is it time to pray? And at this particular point, I like it because almost everybody starts getting very uncomfortable, right? I say, we're going to pray. You know, everyone puckers up, and they're like, oh, gosh, it's going to get religious. It's going to get solemn. For those of you that feel that way, you don't know me. Um, so here's a prayer from AP Delchi. It says, God, grant me the serenity to accept people that will not secure their networks, the courage to face them when they blame me for their problems and the wisdom to go out drinking afterwards. And I think that that's something that we can all get behind, regardless of any type of faith. So this is an open invitation to ADHD. Um, you guys can download it, and you guys can pull it and just run it. Um, you can install it anywhere. It's a simple build script. Uh, you guys can take a picture of this. I'll just leave this up for a couple of seconds. And, it, and it's available for everyone. And, uh, and that's kind of getting back to kind of the point of a lot of this. Oh. <laughs> An InfoSec luminary at a conference called DerbyCon two years ago said, in a few years, pen testing is going to be dead. Not a few years, I think you said eventually 10, 20 years. It's going to be dead. And I feel guilty anytime I give a presentation about how to break things without trying to give back how we can make things better. And I think that everybody in this room, we shouldn't strive to just be hackers, we should be information security engineers. And we gotta try to make things better. So if you look at BHIS, we release ADHD, it's a defensive tool. We release RITA, which is a tool for doing beaconing analysis and doing hunt teaming. We're releasing defensive tools because we don't see any tools that are detecting the attacks that we're running now. And I think that we all need to give back. As we find new offensive capabilities, we desperately need to start developing better defensive capabilities to try to, de try to detect them. And like I said, this isn't about this is the end all be all, but I'm at least saying, hey, we can start thinking differently. So I wanted to say thank you. Um, I'm a pen testing company is offensive, uh, excuse me, is uh, a defensive hunt teaming product. If it's offensive countermeasures, I'm with Black Hills Information Security as well. You guys can call me, I don't care, it's fine. I very rarely get calls. Um, you know, you'd be surprised. Now somebody's like, challenge accepted. I'm calling him all the time. But one more thing on the breaking side. Um, next week, we're going to be releasing an Outlook Web Access two-factor bypass technique. Uh, basically, the ability to break into any Outlook Web Access portal anywhere. Um, just, just, it's going to be cool. Uh, so check it out. This has been an area of research that we've been working on for a long time. I got the registration link, or you guys can pull down the QR codes. If you want to register, uh, please go ahead and go to this link and register, and we're going to get it out next week. Um, but it's, it's cool. Literally, you will be able to break into any Outlook web access portal in a matter of moments. 
um, which is a little bit terrifying, even if two factor is, is enabled on it. I want to say thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for having me out here, and get out here and have your great con.